welcome to Platform Productivity. Uh, this is essentially just going to be uh, session sharing tools that we found useful at Markov and Capstan um, that have helped you know, make our developers' lives easier when it comes to running the platform in an efficient way, connecting to it, you know, debugging, monitoring, logging, etc. And uh, more specifically, we're going to talk about two tools, uh, Kata Operator for Kubernetes and HashiCorp Boundary. And so I will pass it off to Akshay to talk about Kata. Yeah, so basically, uh, the problem statement which is why we need a data operator is key. Organi organization that deploy in Kubernetes cluster, they get built-in auto-scaling via horizontal pod auto-scaling. But it has its limitation. What if you want to scale back the number of pods to zero? Or maybe you want to descale on a specific metric, which is not CPU or memory. So they, this is where KEDA comes in. So, so there could be other potential solutions and, limit, uh, and what are the limitations? One of the solutions could be you can build your own metric server. Like let's say you could basically capture the metrics from, for example, Rabbit, RabbitMQ in Prometheus, create a metric uh, server and configure HP to use that. But then this again is like building the entire solution. And why you want to reinvent the wheel when you have Kata to do all, the, all of this? So that's why we can, instead of building that own infrastructure and trying to do all the things, this way we could just use Kata for it. So what is Kata? It's basically a very lightweight component which can run with your uh, with your, any of the Kubernetes cluster, and you can just uh, it's just need, uh, very easy to install, and it basically works with your HPA, not against it. It's like yeah, and it's something which you can configure in a way where you want to. If you want to use just the HPA metrics, you can you are ready to go and use the HPA metrics. If you want to have your workloads depend on Kata, you can uh, use Kata there. So how it works? So basically, Kata has three components, they are scalers, agents, and uh, 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 this uh, metrics adapter. So it, in, uh, internally, it, is a, it serves as a metric adapter. So you have a scaled object, which is a bunch of, a bunch of YAMLs where you configure uh, your things like from which external metric you want to take the, uh, your events. So metrics could, uh, your external scalers could be an SQSQ, it could be an as your blob storage, it could be Datadog, it could be MySQL queries, Grafana, etc. So there are lots of scalers which Kata supports. Extract those metrics from Kata, extract those metrics from those scalers, add it to Kata. Kata then works with HPA to see whether you want to basically scale or descale. And in case if there is no event, you can even uh, put your deployment to zero. So this is how it works. So there are multiple uh, scalers. For Kata, like you have for Kafka, CloudWatch, Blob Storage, RabbitMQ, Redis, and many more. So Kata deploy, deployment for SQS. So we'll be discussing how uh, on SQS you can use Kata. So basically the flow is, basically you uh, want to scale the Kubernetes jobs. Like one of the examples, you can scale deployments and anything, but here we'll be discussing about Kubernetes jobs. So the flow is given there are no message awaiting in a queue, ideally there should be no job running. And when a message arrives in a queue, it creates a job. If a mover, so the job will pull the message from the queue, do, does the processing, deletes the message. And if more message arrives, it should be able to spawn multiple jobs. So we'll be discussing some, some of the uh, small YAML related to Kata, what it does. Basically, these are some of the configuration which you can say key for a Kubernetes job can have multiple pods. So we can add parallelism here, which is one key. I'll just want a job to have a single pod and that makes my job. Then uh, basically completion is again, if your job is of five pods or six pods, you can add that. Active deadline, this is important because for SQS, there, there's this thing key how, for how much time the message can be away from the queue and still not be uh, available. So you have to have your active deadline in such a way that it is more than uh, basically what you configure in AWS because after a while, the one of the AWS metric will be such that your, uh, your message will be again back in the queue. 
or it will be available for other consumers to consume. So you don't want that. You want key or messages consumed by a single consumer. And so based on that, you can always have a deadline, which is a greater number uh, than the one which AWS this. Back off limit is again the number of retries your pod may be down or your service could be down, maybe your DB could be down within, within the job which is using it. So you can just add these specifications. Then other customizations are like polling interval. So Keda would basically poll your external uh, metric where it is as SQS. So you can configure key at what cadence you want your operator to pull your SQS to get the length of the queue, which is an approximate number. Other things like successful job history limit or failed job history limit is more of a logging purpose where you want to log uh, basically the last 10 jobs or last 10 uh, failed jobs. Scaling strategy is something which has to be taken in account where, because what will happen is one of the things which we observed was ki you add a KDA operator to SQS Let's say just a single message comes to the queue. No job will be spawned because they, it works on the multiple scaling strategies. So one of them is accurate. Accurate is basically take the exact length of the queue instead of uh, taking a number which is number of elements which are in processing plus the number of elements which are in the queue. So if your number of elements in the, which are in processing state uh, is greater than one, which means a, a job is already running, then and if a new element comes to the queue, Data may not spawn a uh, job for it. So you have to check basically which strategy works well for you. There could be systems where you're not entering a single message into queue, but in a bulk like 10 or something like that. Then based on the, and then the trigger, trigger is a part for us, it is AWS SQS. For others, it could be a MySQL uh, database or Grafana queries or uh, blob storage or anything. So here in the metadata, you just add a queue URL. Q length equal to one says this is the minimum length at which I want my KDA operator to be working at. And this is this. Now, what is a Markov ML's use case? So, as you know, Markov ML is basically a platform where you can do multiple things related to your data set. You can register a data set. So, Markov ML provides data analysis on those registered data sets. One such data set, data set analysis is about clustering. You, regist you registered your data set and now you want uh, to see how does that data groups into different categories. So one such analyzer which Markov provides is this vector embedding. So how, it, uh, how, why we use Kata there? So I'll just explain the product use case first. So basically you register a data set, you got the analysis, you got a, uh, basically a cluster of, uh, of your data points. And now some, let's say, uh, you get some external data points and you want to see if there are similar data points in my data set. So you can come to Markov, click on the bunch of those data points or provide your external data points and we'll find out and tell you whether there are similar data points in the data set or not. So how does that happen? So basically for that entire pipeline to work, where a data set is registered, clustering algorithms are run and a data set and let's say, a and embedding is created. The idea of the end product is you want to find similar points. So how do you find similar points? So what we use here is key, let's say uh, uh, your analysis is running in ECS. Once the analysis is run, you basically convert all your data points into embeddings. Vector embeddings, uh, embeddings which can be of any dimensions, let's say 384, 786, two dimension, dimensions again. So you create those into embeddings and we want to store into a database. We use Melvis there. Melvis is basically a vector database where you can basically search for similar points. So what we do here is you run your analysis in a ECS store in S3. And because now the, your data set can be large, it can be 1 million points, 2 million points. So when the analysis is running, you do not want that analysis to take another time to insert that same data into Melvis. So that process has to be asynchronous. And there is not just a single analysis running, there could be multiple users triggering those analysis. There could be multiple ECS jobs which are there. Now these jobs, are based, their work is to run the analysis. And then an asynchronous work is to, once these analysis are run, you also need to store the embeddings in a database. So that has to be asynchronous. For that, this job 
basically sends an event to an SQS. Key. This is the uh, this is the uh, part to my file, and this is the, the event type is to insert data into Milvis, and you just basically run the jobs. One way to do that without Keta was key you configure SQS, run the Kubernetes pods, and they keep running even if there is no message in the SQS, and you just poll every every time you poll and see if there is a message, you do it or not. Otherwise, you don't. Other thing is key. Why you want to waste resources if there is no message in the queue? So here comes Keda. So basically, Keda will work on the SQS, checks if there is a message in the queue. If it, there is a message in the queue, it will uh, initiate, a, in, initiate a job. The job will fetch data from S3, insert it into Milvis, and, and then die. Basically, and if the number of messages increases, it will spawn more number of jobs. And as the queue length is zero, no jobs will be running. And, your, so you, and hence, this entire uh, cycle will complete. I think that, so this is how we use Keda to basically align ourselves uh, to get uh, basically uh, the jobs which run asynchronously without, and if there is no data in the queue, we can just have zero pods running instead of always keeping a server up and running. So this is what we have been using Keda for. And that's my time. I think this is what I wanted to tell about Keda. Yeah. Okay. Over to Chris. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, I can just use this. Yeah. yeah so swapping uh, sort of paths a little bit. Uh, Keda is, you know, making sure your platform is running efficiently. You know, you're minimizing costs, uh, maximizing usage, all that good stuff. Uh, boundary and sort of access management is more when things break or when you need to connect, debug, you know, go to internal dashboards. Um, so let's just set the stage a little bit. Uh, so what is access management? Uh, why is it causing headaches? You know, why is it problematic? So take the example of you have private resources on your platform. You have a production database, for example. In order to make it secure, minimize vulnerability, you cut it off from the internet, and you, you know, have to allow connectivity to your services running within you know, private networks, subnets, that kind of thing. Um, and that's good, and that's great for security. But now, when you as a developer need to go and maybe check some logs, run some queries against it, you're also locked out because you are trying to use the public internet. And so that's where sort of the status quo of uh, VPNs and Bash and Host come in. And so these are two extremely common solutions for how to remedy this problem. And they function, like they, they work, but they cause a lot of uh, issues. And so sort of the two main ones I wanna talk about are unscoped access and onboarding and offboarding effort. Uh, the first one is essentially you know, when you are a part of a VPN, when you connect to the VPN, when you connect to the Bastion host, you have broad access. You are a part of that network. Sure, you can talk to the database, but you can talk to anything else there too. Um, and that brings up some security concerns with sort of, you know, who can you trust? Um, and you need to be really careful about managing these keys, uh, managing connection. Um, second one is the effort of onboarding and offboarding. Uh, so in talking with Arjit about sort of you know, this, these status quo solutions, he was telling me, you know, I don't know how many times I've had to say like, hey Anton, can you add someone to the superset VPN? Uh, and so, you know, this becomes an issue really at companies of any size, but as your platform grows larger and larger, maybe you wanna use multi-cloud offerings, you know? Well, now you have to have VPNs that are configured for each single one, you know? As your team grows bigger and bigger, well then you have to distribute keys to every single person. And you know, if someone leaves, if someone changes positions, maybe they don't need access, you have to take all of those keys back. And these long-lived credentials are really dangerous since you know, if something is, it, it, it's long-lived, if it's existing, you know, maybe it gets posted in a Slack channel somewhere and no one knows and it gets leaked or someone you know, finds that information and boom, your whole platform is essentially compromised. Um, so in comes Boundary. And so Boundary is really trying to be a modern solution to these problems. Uh, it, it, in Capstan's instance, we treat it as sort of a middleman between our identity provider and our platform, so our protector resources. Um, so it connects with your identity provider so that rather than having to manually create users for everyone, we just use Azure AD. You could use you know, Google Workspaces, Okta, anything like that. And so that eliminates a lot of the onboarding and offboarding effort because you don't have to generate these keys for people. You know, as they join your company, you make them a work account and Boundary can sort of read the permissions from there. Um, and it integrates with a lot of tools you might already be using to completely reduce the need for long-lived credentials. So Vault, I imagine, 
fairly standard, fairly common. A lot of people use their <laughs> secrets. Um, and so you can use <coughs> database uh, plugins so that you know, database users get generated as someone connects, and as the connection ends, the user gets deleted. So there's no risk of exposure because it just doesn't exist beyond the session. And so sort of at a broad, uh, at a high level how it works, Boundary has a concept of targets and sessions. Targets, pretty self-explanatory, it is those resources, right? So a database could be a target, you know, an internal dashboard could be a target. Um, and the session is that duration where the user is allowed to connect. It uh, has a lot of tools from modern cloud platforms. So you know, ephemeral IPs, very common services that aren't you know, guaranteed to exist in a particular location. Uh, it can do service discovery to automatically add these and delete these so that you don't have to manage it yourself. Um, and like I mentioned, those plugins that produce uh, hard-lived credentials, or long-lived credentials. Um, and can we refresh the screen, sorry. I just wanna make sure more of the time. Okay, Okay, we have plenty of time, so I can sort of go through this. So uh, this is just an example implementation of how you could implement it uh, within your cloud platform. Uh, essentially, there are two key components uh, to think about, two key services. Uh, it's a controller and a worker. I'll start with the worker, because it's simpler. Uh, your worker is essentially just the thing that proxies your connection. Um, and the controller is kind of the brains of the operation. Uh, it's what you log into. Um, it's what you know, sort of authenticates you using your identity provider, sees who you have access to. Uh, it has all the configurations for all your targets. And so that's sort of the user-facing thing. Um, as far as you know, high availability, you can split it across multiple subnets. Um, and the beauty of this decoupled sort of nature of worker and controller is that you're not bound to having everything in the same platform. So if you want to have all of your backend in AWS, you can have all your controllers and sort of the databases they need there. But if you want to, you know, use something on GCP, use something on Azure, you could have workers running in those that communicate with that singular backend. And so it's really just maintaining and condensing this sort of credential sprawl and kind of this hassle of uh, maintenance. Uh, and so, quick little shameless plug. Uh, Capstan, we currently use Boundary internally, and we also are capable of setting it up for users. And so, if this seems like technology that might be interesting, I'd love to like talk about you know how you can sort of set this up, maybe how we can help you figure things out. A uh, little more just security settings features, um, and then I'm just gonna have a quick little live demo of showing you really just how easy it is to use, um, but just sort of going through really fast. Uh, so, there's a couple of sort of unique things that Boundary does uh, to ensure like a high level of security. Um, the first is that for TLS, for encryption, everything is generated as it's needed. Uh, essentially, as your session begins, it creates the full TLS stack, it distributes it using uh, some key management service, um, and like I said, end-to-end -end for the duration, it's using that generated stack. So, yeah, obviously better than something that's longer lived. Um, you can do a lot of tweaks for sessions. Uh, say you only want one person to connect to a target at a time, you can do that. If you only want them to connect for a certain duration, you can do that. Um, and all of these can be configured with auditing. So you can see, you know, Chris connect to production database at 10 a.m. It lasted 10 minutes, something like that. Um, and one extremely nice thing that I've taken advantage of a lot is you can continue to use all of your local tooling. Um, so if, for example, in a batch and sets instance, excuse me, you might have to reset up sort of the, the tools you're familiar with, for example, like a PG Admin, Table Plus, that kind of thing. Uh, because Boundary runs a local agent, it can use anything natively that's already on your computer, um, so you don't have to sort of redeploy that or reinstall that, uh, reconfigure all that. So just gonna do a brief little demo. Uh, this might be a little tricky with the mic, but we'll see what we can do. No, it's fine, I got it, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> um, so let me just, I just want to jump into the UI and just sort of, oops, that's not helpful. Come on. Here we go. Jump into the UI and just short, sort of show you what it looks like. Uh, so here's just an example boundary instance I've set up locally. Um, and so this is uh, a list of targets like I was mentioning. So I have uh, two, or I have the same database. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> Good, cool, okay. Um, so let's just sort of go through and see what we have here. So this is just a list of targets I've set up. Like I said, those are those different resources you wanna connect to. Um, I'm gonna start at the bottom because they're, there's essentially three to look at. It's the two database ones and the Minikube one. 
Minikube, just because I wanted to do it locally, but this could be your production cluster. Um, you know, essentially, if you want to connect via a service account to run whatever commands you need to do. Uh, but the two databases, I think, are a little more interesting. Uh, so this uses Vault's database secret uh, plugin. So these connect to the same database, but they generate a different type of user. Uh, so one is a database admin, and the other is an analyst. And so this allows you to really have like minimal amount of trust needed. Um, you could you know, create a user that maybe can only run like read select queries, and you can say people with certain roles in my identity provider, let them do this. Versus you know, maybe like a, an administrator, like someone who's higher up, you could let them have access to the admin thing. Um, and these are both, like I said, generated just in time, deleted after use. Um, let's see what else we have, and I can just sort of I'm, it's not the prettiest to look at, so I just want to show So, You hook up Vault as a credential store that essentially just tells it, hey, generate these credentials. Um, just really quick, I just want to show sort of the database user generation action, and then we can just do questions. Um, so say, for example, I want to connect to this database as an analyst. Uh, you can use the CLI, or you could use, uh, there's a desktop client as well. I'm going to use the CLI because it's convenient. Uh, first off, you would authenticate, so in this case, Crank the font. Yeah. Hopefully that's not too bad. Uh, you would authenticate, so it's as simple as just running a command boundary authenticate. Uh, I'm using username and password because it's a simple local thing. Uh, now I'll, I'll have a link to the repo of how I set all this up if anyone sort of wants to see that. Um, so yeah, simply authenticate, right? Log in, you know, this one's just admin password. Uh, bam, I'm authenticated. Uh, next is just boundary connect. And so it comes with a bunch of out-of-the-box uh, plugins, sort of making it easier to connect to things. Uh, so there's a Postgres plugin which just runs PSQL for you, which I'm just going to use here because it's convenient. Uh, so it's been to connect to Postgres. You pass in that target ID that I showed you in the UI. Uh, and then you specify the database name. And there's an issue with the font. I'm not sure what's going on here. Well, just in case I already planned to have some slides, in case this didn't work, so I'll just show the slides. <laughs> um, so let's go down here to the bottom. Okay. So essentially, this is what I wanted to show. Uh, you can see here before I connect, there are a couple users I've set up. So these are the two users that will get automatically, uh, two roles that will get automatically generated users for when created. Uh, so none exist. And then I connect. Um, and you can see I have permission since I'm in this analyst role. I can run these select queries. I can't run drop queries because that's not what it's configured for. And if we go back to seeing the user's role, you can see it generated this V token analyst um, for the duration of my session. And I don't know if I included a screenshot because technically it would just go back to the original one. But once I end within a few minutes, I think it, you can tune it, uh, it deletes it. So I can't use it after. Um, the other plugin I want to show oh, sorry, was uh, Kubernetes. This one's a little clunkier. Um, I'm not sure if it's an issue with my configuration, but essentially it will, this is probably not very readable, but <laughs> You use the Kubernetes plugin. Um, it will generate a service account. It'll give you the CA cert you need to connect, uh, as well as the service account token. You plug those in, and same concept, right? While the session is live, it works. You can connect to the cluster. Once the session ends, that no longer works. Um, and it's all manageable from the UI, where you can see, you know, Chris is connected to, in this case, it's Grafana, but that could be database, whatever. Um, and as an admin, you can cancel it, yada, yada. Uh, and so sort of the big takeaways, let me go back. Uh, here we go. The sort of big three takeaways I want to get across is that Boundary helps us keep things simple, secure, and flexible. And so I don't want to spend the time configuring access for everyone on my team. Even if we're a small team, it's still a hassle. And you know, as people change roles, like I said, I don't want to have to worry about cleaning up every single thing. And so it's just nice. It's, keeps things integrated with something we're already maintaining in an identity provider. Uh, it keeps us secure. Like I said, no credential sprawl means less chance of leaks. And it keeps us flexible, right? If we want to swap identity providers, swap it out, no problem. If we want to swap clouds, you know, add different clouds, add another worker, no problem. And so sort of the questions for you, right, you know, should I use Boundary? Uh, I would strongly consider it if you want to stay flexible for multi-cloud, if you value 
being able to audit user sessions. If you want to give limited access and sort of need limited trust um, and not have to worry about, you know, is this person going to potentially use this for harm, right? Um, and finally, if you can justify the operating cost, it's not expensive, but you do need uh, either, you know, an EC2 instance, a Kubernetes pod, and a database. Uh, and with that in mind, any questions? <coughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess for which one? <laughs> well, actually, to both of you. Okay, yeah. So I'm looking at these tools, and they make a lot of sense to me that they could potentially be big time savers. Mm -hmm. But how do we make that trade off between do we invest more? Now, in the platform productivity and try to make developers faster, or uh, do we kind of like shove that down the line because we've got other priorities? Like, how do you make the case that we should bring boundary into our infrastructure mm. now mm. rather than a year from now or two years from now when the problem is, is worse? Yeah, do you want to take that first and then I'll answer it? Yeah. yeah. trade off of doing things now and versus doing things then mostly uh, how I see this is uh, I, don't, I don't think yours is amplifying. Do you have to push it? Yeah. Oh, it's on? Okay. How I see it is key, uh, basically the uh, developers are meant to do a similar product and uh, if you uh, taking the developer time to work on the platform which is not uh, external to the customer it's internal, everything that we do here is uh, internal to the platform. It's, uh, and you have the resources, it's better to utilize those developer apps in getting the product than as compared to uh, building things with all the building of the internet are already there. And you can just easily use it. Yeah, and I think for boundary, again, I'll start with the. Oh, do we have feedback on the mic? Okay, now we're good. I'll start with that. Okay. I'll start with another kind of shameless plug here, right? Like I said at Capstan, we already do this for users. Uh, they yes, that's the answer I wanted. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's extremely simple. I mean, I, I don't want to show the UI right now because I don't want to open up a bunch of tabs, but I guess you, can, you can take my word and I can show it later. Um, it's as simple as, you know, have a validated TLS certificate, click, 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 bunch of databases, you know, click create, we handle the rest. And it's set up for you you can access it at that certificate. You can reuse your roles that you configure in Capstan. So if you have, you know, if this, if one role has the ability to connect to infrastructure, well then any user in Capstan who has that roles can do that. Um, aside from Capstan, I think it is definitely a question of sort of what is the risk and what is, like, we'll start with risk. I think it's risk and time. Those are kind of the two things to consider, right? It's how bad is it if this doesn't work? My guess is in most cases, pretty bad, right? How bad is it if credentials get leaked? Probably pretty bad. Um, and thinking about time, like I said, it does, it, it has a, a sort of spike in initial time, but it actually lowers the amount of maintenance time. So rather than needing to, like I said, set it up for every single user, you set it up once, and sure, it might take, you know, I don't know, a couple days, maybe a week tops, but that means that you aren't, like I said in the beginning, right? you aren't every couple of weeks, maybe every month saying, hey, Anton, add someone to the VPN. You know, you can just do it by adding them to, the, to your Google workspace, which you're already adding them to, right? It's like, uh, like any investment, there's uh, an upfront cost, yeah. uh, like a boundary, you mean you described it as simple, but uh, it, on top of the actual tool itself, I would have to train engineers, uh, get everybody on the same page, uh, you know, switch over these different services to using the system. As far as using it, is that what you're saying? Yeah. So the connection is as simple as I demonstrated, where it's yeah. you just run the command. As far as getting, you know, teaching engineers how to use it, I mean, if they know how to use things that are running on a local machine, they know how to use it, right? Because like when I connect to my production database, it's because the agent is running on my local machine, it's as if it's there. And so if your developers know how to do that, they already know how to use Boundary. Any other questions? Oh, are we good on time? Okay, okay. Uh, sorry, I thought you were. Oh, okay, okay. We have plenty of time. Yeah. I guess. Uh, my question is for the auto scaler. Yeah. I think uh, Capstan uses. Uh, we just use plain HPA. 
it's just built in horizontal Do, files. Just the, I forgot the name. It also starts with K. Oh, uh, Carpenter. Carpenter. Uh, different, uh, different. Uh, use cases, yeah. Not okay. different use cases, but kind of. I'll, I'll let you so. The Carpenter is mostly uh, 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 node auto scaler. Can I mute this So for Keda, um, what are you guys seeing in terms of like the initial pod coming up time? Like you, it, it, there's an SQ, uh, a thing comes into an SQS from that point and on until the very first line of code getting executed for it. What are you guys looking at? Like, what's the time duration we're looking at here? So we, are, uh, I think mostly what we have observed it, uh, it takes uh, ten seconds to spawn up the new pod. Uh, the time the message in the queue and it start getting processed after a job is created. So the job creation will pull, pull the image, spin up the pod and then process that. But that time is very short, like 10 to 12 seconds it takes to get a job done, uh, start. Okay, so you're, you're not worried too much about like, you know, you may have to bring up a new node, in, install a pod over there, yada, yada, yada. But that's, that's a pretty seamless era. You know, yes, Given that the idea was to have this async process itself uh, on the on the first place, uh, it makes uh, valid to that we can have some time before the data is present in our databases for this use case. And the next question that I have for boundary, did I hear you right, Chris? You were talking about um, boundary takes a week to set up. in order to understand the concepts and you know, sort of form everything together. I would say, in single cloud, pretty simple to do one person plan about a week. Like, is that okay. from not understanding at all to having it configured in about a week? Um, yeah. You know, that was also learning all the concepts as well. Got it. Uh, but like I said, you know, this is yeah. something that like, we can help people with as well. It's, it's definitely a solution that can be made a lot simpler mm -hmm. um, with, you know, like a good sort of user-facing uh, interface, yeah. Got it. And then how are you finding in terms of not the like databases of the world, but like vendors? If I'm using third party that I want to give out, you know, mm. accesses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, yeah. How many integrations, shall we say, are there for it? Let me make sure I understand the question. So I'm, I'm going to sort of describe the situation I imagine you're saying, if not, correct me. Uh, I imagine you're saying, you know, we have a database and we want some third party to maybe have access to particular things on it. How hard is it to give them that access? No, I don't. So, so um, I'm talking about, say, for example, well, if I want a just-in-time access mm. to hand it out to the developers for, mm. say, things like Postman mm -hmm. or um, Lucid Charts, mm -hmm. things like that, those, you know, those bunch of SaaS things mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. that means the boundary has to have some kind of an integration to that thing. I right? see what you're saying. So to you, create a user and all that. I see what you're saying, yeah. So currently all of those just-in-time things are handled by Vault, and so that's essentially a question of like what Vault can handle, uh, and I, I'm not aware of sort of the full range of that. Um, I'm sure there, so Boundary is also, a, it has, like most HashiCorp things, has a, you know, a hosted version and an open source version. I'm sure there's probably some community support for a lot of things like that, but I guess that would be a Vault plugin support. Um, so I can't speak to, I guess, like every single sort of third-party thing, um, but I, I don't want to speculate, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure for, yeah. Uh, Chris, you took an example of Postgres, mm -hmm. just to show like how easy it is to run a Postgres command directly mm -hmm. with authentication, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you could actually have an any host, so any IP address, any port, uh, TCP, IP, HTTP, so you can just, like if the plugin doesn't exist, you can just have the default access by port. So the target system, for you to give access to target system, you don't necessarily need a plugin all the time. It just makes it easy for you to both authenticate and fire a command from a single line. But, but I, 
like Grafana. Yeah, I think like Grafana. We don't have. A, it's not a plugin. Uh, you just yes. open a, you know, you just open an HTTPS port uh, with an authenticate, and then just open it in your browser. Right, that works if you're hosting. Ah, oh, I yeah. think. Uh, okay. Oh, right. right. Yeah. Right. Okay, I see. That part, I'm yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm not super familiar with sort of. Even, even the company that's built boundary, I doubt they've built connections to any third party SaaS. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, we have, we have four minutes. If anyone has any other questions, if not, well, good. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just curious. What if um, there isn't a plugin in Boundary for something? Like if there weren't a Postgres plugin, is it going to spit out a username and password? Or? Yeah. So essentially the, the plugins are sort of a additional feature, right? Even if there's no plugins, you can use Boundary to proxy access to private resources. So something I do pretty frequently is rather than using that Postgres plugin, um, so I guess this doesn't work for the just-in-time generic credentials, but you know, if I have like a, a example like testing environment, maybe I don't really care about the, the just-in-time credentials, I can just proxy a plain old TCP connection and open it with you know, like table plus PG admin or something with hard-coded credentials. And so that, in that case, you don't get all these benefits of just-in-time users, but you still get all the benefits of auditing, you know, session management, uh, that sort of abstraction of like, I don't need to know where this database is living. It can sort of figure it out and just connect to me, um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, does it, and then does it, sh if you have the hard-coded credentials, does it shut off the proxy access? As or it's always available. By it seems like it would be able to at least shut off the the access, right? The network access. Explain. So explain. I think maybe I'm slightly confused. Um, so you you go to Boundary and you say I need mm -hmm. a connection to this mm -hmm. database mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I have credentials mm -hmm. for. It needs to do the proxy piece in uh, order to have I see what you're that saying. network connection. So it can proxy the connection and sort of prompt you to do the login, right? Like it it's. The plugin handles both in that case, but if you don't have the plugin, it will just yeah. open that connection. And you know, for example, if you're using like PSQL, it'll say like you know, enter password for user or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, if there are no other questions, I think we're at about ish time. So I appreciate you all coming. <laughs>